We're all doomed. The planet's going to hell in a handcart. We keep getting told that global warming is unstoppable, and we might just as well put a bag over our heads and give up now. Asia has to take more than its fair share of stick when it comes to greenhouse gases. It's come late to the industrialization party, but since it arrived, it's been hogging the dance floor and eating all the dips. That's because Asia has become the world's factory, and that means loads more emissions. But as a continent that's changing faster than you can blink, it's also the natural home for a special group of people who aren't tied down by conventional thinking. They're scientists and activists, movers and shakers, and they're coming up with some unexpected, even crazy solutions to the problems we all face. Everything we do creates waste. Waste in the form of used gadgets, or packaging, or bits of food we don't fancy. All of which we used energy to produce, and all of which we have to use energy to get rid of again. It's the flip side of having industrious and affluent societies. So the change makers are looking at ways to curb waste looking to use green materials, or recycle old appliances, making use of rubbish, or even turning it into something we can eat, or making it disappear entirely for an ideal, garbage-free world. The biggest waste product of all, and the one that's really causing all the problems in the first place, is carbon dioxide. But surprisingly little is known about how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere in any one place at any one time. Information that would not only make scientists moist with excitement, but would also help governments to do something useful about it. To get an overview of what's going on in the atmosphere, you need to uh, get over it and view it. Which means you need a satellite, and a space rocket. Which, of course, means loads of waste, as they burn up hundreds of tons of fuel in just a few seconds. And in most cases, are also thrown away after just one use. But some projects are really worth it. GOSAT's home is Tsukuba, Japan's rocket city, a short distance outside Tokyo. Takashi Hamazaki, lead scientist on the GOSAT project, has realized that if we're going to do anything about greenhouse gases, we're going to need to know a whole lot more about them, how they form and how they dissipate, and where they like to hang about up to no good. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact um, status of the world distribution of carbon dioxide. Somewhere it is emitted, somewhere it is absorbed. So he's building a satellite to show us exactly what the CO2 is doing. GOSAT. At present, there are only ground level stations measuring CO2 levels about 282 of them, mostly in the developed world with measurements recorded monthly or even less often. That's not really enough to follow what's going on worldwide from day to day. GOSAT is said to measure at 56,000 points, passing over each point on the Earth once every three days, something of a leap in the amount of data gathered. All a satellite is, in fact, is a handy box and power supply for a set of orbiting instruments. All satellites are covered in a distinctive gold film, making them look as if they belong more on a Christmas tree. When it's in orbit, the sunny side of the satellite can reach 100 degrees centigrade, and the dark side, minus 100. 
There can be some massive temperature fluctuations going on, with GOSATs swinging around the planet once every hundred minutes. That puts a strain on the equipment. And it can also have an effect on the accuracy of the whole operation. So scientists came up with a multi-layered composite to protect the delicate equipment inside, and which just happens to be all crinkly and gold. So GOSAT has two major sensors. One sensor over there is a primary sensor. It detects the global distribution of carbon dioxide and methane. And it will detect them with pinpoint accuracy. The sun naturally emits infrared rays, which bounce off the surface of the Earth. As they pass through the atmosphere, certain wavelengths are absorbed by CO2 and other greenhouse gases. The device can calculate just how much there is about. The second sensor, smaller one, is a sensor to detect the cloud and aerosol. Clouds and aerosols are basically just muck in the air, such as smoke, pollution and dust. They could interfere with the main sensor's readings and make them less accurate. And frankly, there's no point in chucking the 200 million US dollars satellite into space if it's not going to be accurate. Now renamed Ibuki, or Breath, the satellite has made it safely into orbit. But it'll take a while to calibrate it and then to assess the data once it starts flowing. Ibuki will be one of the most important sources of information on how greenhouse gases move and develop. An invaluable tool to help us all target CO2 emissions and drag them down. Worth its weight in shiny gold foil. I believe we can see the breathing of the Earth. That's what I want to get and I want to show it to, to you soon. The more we consume, the more we throw away. One of the fastest evolving industries involves computers, and making them last longer with less waste and with more eco-friendly components is something that companies are striving for. Modern, vibrant Taiwan is the center of much of the world's electronics industry. They've been making quality components here for years. One major computer manufacturer is finding its niche, knocking out computers with a fashionably green edge. Management, tasked Peter Clark, and his international group of young designers, to come up with something that fits in with the spirit of the age a new green material. They believe that even a small gesture will help raise consumer awareness and make natural materials desirable. In the past, we've tried out aluminum, uh, uh, carbon fiber, leather, and we've looked at different materials. So they came up with bamboo, Asia's wonder grass. Long, thin sticks of light, hollow wood. Not what might first bring to mind for making a computer, but it has form in this part of the world. So really, the bamboo is, is really the iconic Chinese culture building material, right? Yeah. Used for everything. Yeah. Clothes, cooking, cooking, cooking eating, eating. Drinking. drinking as well. Versatile as bamboo is, can it possibly be practical for consumer electronics? Well, there are just a few qualities needed for a computer's body. It has to be safe, and it has to be strong, and it has to be light. That's it. Which makes bamboo seem pretty much ideal. But actually making a notebook out of glorified grass takes some doing. We tried several iterations how to produce this. The first stage was using a very thin sheet of bamboo. By cutting the bamboo and combining it into a brick of bamboo, which we call lambu for laminated bamboo, and then take a very thin slice of it and glue it onto the LCD cover of the notebook. Once you've got your lambu decided on, and it's for looks as much as for practicality, 
There are all the design considerations as to how to bond it to the electronics and just how much petroleum-based plastic can actually be replaced with wood. Maybe we can use the bamboo in this area here. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a trackpad being bamboo. I don't know. Maybe we can ask the engineers. Trackpad, yeah. I'm not sure. And there are other issues, heat retention being one of them. Bamboo's a good insulator, so a computer could overheat quickly. The bamboo, we had to do a lot of testing to get around this. So we put uh, several layers of coating to protect against this, and we find that this solves the issues that we would otherwise have. And there you have it, a nice wooden computer. But the question is, how green is it really? Or is this just a case of corporate greenwash? One of the large benefits of using green materials is that you're trying to reduce the amount of processes. You're trying to reduce the amount of effort it takes to make a beautiful product. If a notebook is a desirable item, chances are it'll be kept longer. And it can be kept up to date because the design is modular. Bits can be taken out and replaced easily and all the plastics used are clearly labelled for easy recycling once the bamboo-clad notebook is finally finished with. Alternative materials can help to reduce the amount of waste when a product is no longer required. And once you start thinking of alternative materials, well, the world's your oyster. Or your crunchy cutlery if you're an Indian changemaker with an enterprising eye. Informal eating means plenty of disposable cutlery. Mostly made from plastic, which is mostly made from petroleum. Every year, 80 million tons of plastic are made around the world, and a sizable proportion of that is plastic knives, forks and spoons. Which was enough to get the goat of Narayana Pisapati when he was on a plane. Plastic cutlery was given and I said, ah, gosh, again, plastic. Every day there are plane loads of people traveling all over the world. So much of uh, plastic uh, cutlery comes out. Is there something I can do about it? His goat got. Pisapati gave up his job as a research scientist and since then has devoted his life to developing cutlery that you can eat. If you eat your spoon, there's no waste at all, he reckoned. Well, not for the few hours it passes through the digestive tract, anyway. On the outskirts of high-tech Hyderabad, he has a decidedly low-tech pilot facility for making edible spoons. Pisa Patti has tracked down what he feels is the ideal ingredient for them. Sorghum, or to give it its local name, Joa. It's good for people with cholesterol problem, diabetes problem. It's good for pregnant women, to lactating mothers, to toddlers, to growing children, to adolescents, to adults. It's got calcium and iron and vitamins in. It's gluten-free and so it's, it's, it's very good product. Not that it was so easy to make spoons out of. Plenty of trial and error was needed to get spoons that tasted okay, weren't too hard or too soft, and didn't fall apart when dunked. Sorghum doesn't have the binding properties. But then when I put some other flowers and then rolled it and I did it, and I dipped it in water and kept it dipped for 15 minutes, I didn't get soggy at all. I said, yes, this is my product. Once the magic formula was sorted out, production could start. It's not a complex process, something like making a biscuit. You make a dough out of the mixed joar and other flowers and knead it. The dough is then fed through a rolling machine and a cutter, which produces simple strips. The strips are pressed into special molds. And finally, they're baked for 20 minutes in a hot oven. Some batches have spinach, carrot, beetroot thrown in to vary the flavors and colors. Because when it comes down to it, when you've eaten one spoon, you've eaten them all.
It hasn't been easy for Pisa Patti to get this far, especially when it comes to finding investment. Oh yeah, very, very, very difficult, very difficult, very, very difficult, I would say. So, very difficult then. Risking everything, he sold his flat in order to pay for this small factory. But now there's enough interest in Pisa Patti's nutritious spoons for him to consider moving to new premises where the process can be larger scale and automated. And it doesn't stop with spoons, knives, forks. Who knows, even sporks could come next. Pisa Patti plans to invade the massive Japanese chopstick market with his no-waste sorghum tableware. Pisa Patti is a man with a vision of a world where we're not drowning in disposable cutlery because we've eaten it all. Eating your waste is one green way of dealing with it. Probably not the best solution for old household appliances, though. Some are born changemakers, some achieve changemaking, and some have changemaking thrust upon them. Kazuyuki Tomita of Panasonic has been appointed head of a huge appliance recycling center in the middle of Japan. At this and its sister plants across the country, around 72,000 tons of appliances are recycled every year. 700,000 units at this plant alone. Tomita is particularly excited about all the CRT TVs that are being thrown out as Japan upgrades to the latest HD LCDs. Treasure hunt. The party game where a set of obvious clues usually leads to a rather disappointing prize. Here, though, the rewards can be somewhat greater. Your average TV contains wood, aluminium, plastic, glass, semiconductors, exotic metals, weird chemicals. All of these have a value if you can extract them without expending too much energy. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense in the great cosmic green calculator. First, the TV is pulled out of its housing, then cleaned off. TVs collect dust almost as well as vacuum cleaners. Any control boards and electronics are removed and sorted. The boards have lead solder as well as other materials all stuck together, so they're sent off to a specialist plant for recycling. Most plastics are turned into bits of new appliances or even into garden furniture. The hardest parts to deal with are the TV tubes themselves. 60% of any TV is the tube. And just to make life harder, the tube's actually made out of two kinds of glass. The hard and heavy front part, which is coated with phosphors, and the back part, the so-called funnel, made from lead glass designed to minimize radiation. While glass isn't exactly the world's most scarce resource, consisting largely of sand, it's a lot more energy efficient to recycle glass than to make it new. There are just four kinds of appliance that currently have to be recycled under Japanese law. TVs, air cons, washing machines, and refrigerators. This doesn't go as far as current EU law, which demands that all electronics and electrical devices go through recycling. But it's still more progressive than the US, where it's left up to individual cities and states what they do. And consequently, 60 to 70% of US waste still ends up in landfill. Already, up to 80% of these appliances can be recycled at Tomita's plant. And the scientists are always coming up with more and more efficient ways of dealing with all the components. 
それがリサイクルをやってることの意味だと思うんですねだからパナソニックの中でもリサイクル素材を保湿を全て循環させていくそれによって新しくエネルギーをつかないで済むという世界を築き上げていかなくてはいけないんじゃないかと思ってます。While appliances full of golden goodies can be recycled, there's a great deal of stuff that's just going to end up on the tip, from gadget to garbage. Tiny crowded Singapore, with its 4 million plus inhabitants, manages to chuck out 7,000 tons every day, and has nowhere obvious to put it. So it's going to try to solve its space problem by turning the rubbish into extra territory. All under the watchful eye of the biodiversity experts. Singapore is in love with shopping. There's nothing that makes your average Singaporean happier than something shiny and new. But on an island just a tenth the size of Rhode Island, but with four times the number of people, there's not much space. So if you get something new, you're going to need to throw out something old. Usually that means possessions, not the grandparents. And that's on top of all the usual everyday rubbish, all of which means loads of junk. So how to deal with all that trash? A larger country can, up to a point, dig holes in the ground, drop everything in it and forget about it. Not so tiny Singapore. So, rather controversially, it's decided to dump everything bang next to the marine wildlife haven of Semakau Island and turn it into useful extra land. A five minute walk away from the road lies Semakau's intertidal area. A group of student volunteers leads the way. A short trip through a patch of mosquito infested jungle. Leads to the finest feature of Semakau. It's a uniquely shallow beach, revealed only at low tide. Maybe not that spectacular, but it has its charms. I guess what's so special about this place is that despite the development, we still get a lot of um, marine life, and in terms of biodiversity, it's really, really very rich. The area simply teems with wildlife. And at each low tide, a whole new selection is revealed. Ron Yeo Keng Hai of the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity and the students are keeping a close eye on it all. So this is the sand fish sea cucumber, and this is the one that you can find in restaurants. Sea cucumbers, as you know, they actually breathe through their anus. This is what we call a detritor feeder, meaning that they feed on any kind of like um, tiny organic particles that's on the sand. It's not as if there isn't enough pressure on the wildlife here already. This is one of the busiest shipping channels in the world, filled with container ships on their way to port. There are power plants and massive oil refineries. So chucking all the rubbish in this direction as well might not seem like such a good idea at first sight. The thing is, Singapore's chronically short of land for housing, leisure activities, and of course, shopping opportunities. The answer has always been reclamation. By 2030, it's projected that Singapore will have expanded in size by 25%. So making a whole new island out of the massive amount of rubbish that Singapore chucks out daily starts to seem like a very good idea. The first step is to gather all the rubbish together in four facilities around the island. There, it's dumped in a little hole and stirred around a bit. The atmospheric pressure here is kept lower than on the outside, which helps keep the odors in. And water spray damps down the inevitable cloying dust. The grabs take the rubbish and encourage it further down the chutes into a furnace where it's incinerated at high temperatures. Out of the far end comes ash. The rubbish has been reduced to a fraction of its former self. 
It's not exactly clean, but it should be fairly non-toxic, with the dioxins and other substances removed during the incineration process. The incineration plants are all built near the sea. It's intentional as the ash is then loaded onto massive barges. These then head off into Singapore's narrow waters. Destination, Semakau. The ash is unloaded from the barges, trucked a few hundred meters, and dumped, just like in a landfill. But it's actually sea fill. The hopefully inert ash is being used as reclamation material. Slowly, the island is expanding. New land from garbage. And it's free, unlike the costly imported sand you'd normally use. Plants have sprung up across some already filled sections. More and more ash will be piled on, landscaping the new island with hills and valleys. Before that happens, there are plenty of new cells waiting to be filled. The ash may be more or less inert, but a sudden outflow could smother marine life for miles around. Barely visible at the rocky edges of the cells, giant sheets of membrane designed to keep the ash in place, a shield against a leakage of ash into the open sea. But can this simple measure possibly be enough to prevent pollution of the precious wildlife haven next door? The government, when they're developing this place, they try to uh, minimise the damage done to the surrounding environment. And that's why I think the wildlife here managed to thrive so, so well. You can still see things like corals, which are very, very sensitive if there's any kind of pollution, even mangroves. Mangroves um, can detect even a little bit of leakage of any toxins. The student volunteers are going to help keep tabs on species diversity and numbers. If any nasty toxins leak out of the dump, they'll be spotted right away. For now, Ron is cautiously optimistic. Perhaps it's possible for an island made out of garbage to be a place where the wildlife can live happily ever after. I would say that it's quite successful, at least from what we can see now. A marine park is something that we're really lacking, and it would be great if they can just convert this place to a marine park so that we can better protect the, the marine life here. So that's something that I really hope to see in the future. It's a brave experiment that tackles two problems in one go. Singapore's land space shortage and its mountains of garbage. If it's a success, then it could spell the future for many countries around the world. Though what Singapore will do when Semakau is full, projected for 2045, is anybody's guess. Elsewhere, there's plenty of old land that needs looking after. Nowhere more than in Japan, a full-size country that's been developed for centuries. Japan's cities are by and large grey, industrial, crowded, and dedicated to work. Not exactly restful then. So it's scarcely surprising that the Japanese love nature. They love it so much that they've actually made a list of the top ten views in Japan. This view of a bay near Kyotango in Honshu Island comes in at number three. And it was living alongside this landscape that inspired former clothing salesman Mitsuhiro Kabata and his chemist wife Yukako to start a business that makes a difference. Kyotango is a peaceful, traditional little town around 450 kilometers from Tokyo, where life has changed little for centuries. Well, there have been a few small changes. Outside the village shop, there's a vending machine. 
and once she's done cooking, the shopkeeper's wife brings out her used cooking oil and pours it into this container instead of down the drain and straight into the sea, which was what happened before Mr. Kabata came along. Mr. Kabata, often at the wheel in his sales job, thought about all that used oil polluting his beloved environment and decided to do something about it. Why not take the oil and turn it into something useful? The first step was to persuade people not to throw the oil away in the first place. Not so easy in such a conservative area. Bit by bit, the people came around. After all, no one wants to seem like a dirty polluter. Soon, Mr. Kabata had set up a collection run, with homes, restaurants, and guest houses all making their contribution. It didn't take long for there to be 200 collection points within a radius of 25 kilometers. This comes to a lot of oil. They collect upwards of 50,000 liters a year. So what to do with all this oil? For Mr. Kabata, it was obvious. Ask his wife to sort it out. In her role as chemist. With her advice and expertise to hand, the couple decided to leave the car outside and convert the garage into something more unusual. To be exact, an oil refinery. Because they're turning the used vegetable oil into biodiesel. All the oil goes into the top of the machine. It's for transesterification, a fancy word which means converting all the fats that could congeal inside an engine into something much more useful. After a process lasting 24 hours or so, the fuel is ready for decanting. The oil coming out looks, well, pretty much like what went in. But Mrs. Kabata does a thorough quality check to make sure that what goes into the drums is proper biodiesel. For Mr. Kabata, the business model is just as important as the carbon neutral product itself. He doesn't want to expand production beyond current levels. Mr. Kabata is proud that this is a local initiative. He sees it as a pattern for energy efficient communities around the world. But more simply than that, it's something good to do. In Kyotango, thinking local and taking personal responsibility is becoming a way of life. However, in bustling, overcrowded India, even the simplest action can be overwhelming. And the level of waste has to be seen to be believed. The most exciting and relevant technologies when facing global warming don't have to be the latest, most expensive and complex. Simple and ancient does the trick just as well, if not better. There have been potters in this Indian roadside village selling their wares since time immemorial. You can even buy a ceramic elephant if that tickles your fancy. But the lives of this family of potters were changed forever when a mysterious lady happened by 
with an unusual design in her hand that she said would be good for the planet. The new design was unlike anything the family had made before. Three stacking pots in plain terracotta with holes in the side and also in the bottom. However, she would buy 200 sets a month, which goes a long way to keeping the business going. The mysterious lady is in fact Poonam Bia Kasturi of Bangalore, a former industrial designer. Her pride and joy, her world-saving daily dump organization. Her idea was simple. Instead of chucking out all the organic home waste, food scraps for the most part, people should put it to good use. I want everybody to compost in India. Every home to be managing their waste. Composting. In nature, it's how dead plants and other organic matter breaks down to nourish the soil. Not so easy to do in the ever-expanding cities of India. Part of the spread includes an increasing middle class. And that's where the problem of waste lies. Even when we um, skin a vegetable, poor people make a chutney out of the vegetable skin, which we don't. So they really don't generate waste. <laughs> they shouldn't be composting. They don't need to. We do. Fortunately, the middle classes have the solution in and around their nice houses and flats. Gardens and window boxes, all of which need nourishing. So, Poonam argues, why throw out waste and buy in compost when you can just turn the one into the other? So, the Daily Dump was born, <laughs> dedicated to getting people to compost at home. La la. The process is simple enough, and Daily Dump provides everything you need to get started, as Kavita, the customer relations lady, explains. What we essentially do is put the waste into the top pot and add some dry leaves. And every time you add the dry leaves, you have to mix it with the rake. And we keep repeating this process till the pot is 75% full. The terracotta pots are used because they breathe, apart from looking nicer. Plastic bins are cheaper, but they hold in all the moisture, and so the compost can get pretty rank. So in 20 days, this pot is full, and you've kept it here, you've brought the second one up, and it takes another 20 days for that pot to get full. And in that time, the first pot would have got decomposed to a very large extent. The level would have gone down by almost 70%, and it would have turned black in color. That's the time when you just tip it into the bottom pot. And that's where your compost collects. There's been some resistance to home composting. It's seen as dirty and smelly. I didn't know you can generate millions of maggots. I mean, not even thousands. You generate millions of them. And they're really squirmy. You can open a lid and they're all one living mass over there and they're moving. Luckily, there's a solution. Seeds of the neem tree. It's a natural pesticide which keeps maggots and slugs under control. And for the more persistent pests, and for improving the general farmy aroma... This is lemongrass oil spray. It has a very nice, fresh, lemony fragrance, and it keeps the fruit flies at bay. Poonam is persuading even gardenless flat dwellers in Bangalore to start composting. Trees in the street will appreciate a bit of nice compost, and local garden centers all need a constant supply. But with so far only 2,000 clients in a city of 6.2 million, there's clearly a long way for Poonam to go and it can be a hard sell. Frankly speaking, if you don't compost, it's cheaper to you. But it's more expensive to your world. Therefore, the reason cannot be only economics. You have to tell everybody, your neighbor and yourself, that you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Organic waste turns out to be a treasure trove. One of its major constituents is water. And water is going to be more and more of a precious resource as climate change kicks in. One man has decided he can sort out our serious water issues and dispose of our waste too. Obviously, we need someone really, really clever to sort out the problem of waste. 
So why not call on a rocket scientist? Japanese space agency JAXA has given Mitsuo Oguchi a lab of his own, where he can play with what's left of his lunch. This unappealing soup goes into the top of his machine. Change a few settings and then wait. Time for Mr. Aguchi's <laughs> philosophy. It's not a surprise that Mr. Aguchi comes from the space program. It's all very well to have your feet in the gutter and be looking at the stars. But when the gutter's overflowing with garbage, you tend to notice it. So Mr. Aguchi is boldly going where no man really wants to go at all, into the garbage. After a while, the machine has gone through its motions. And the waste is gone, completely gone. <laughs> In its place, pure water, laced with inorganic trace elements, suitable for fertilizer. Filter them out, and you're left with nothing but water. This all seems rather unlikely. Simply put, organic waste, like the rest of us, breaks down under heat and pressure. And we're talking hot. This is so the waste doesn't burn as such, but it does oxidize. Some organic compounds are very sturdy and can resist even a couple of rounds of this onslaught. But a handy catalyst breaks down even their resistance. The hydrogen in the organic compounds combines with the oxygen to create H2O, or water. The carbon combines with the remaining oxygen to create CO2. Yes, unfortunately, a greenhouse gas is the result. So how is this a battle won against global warming? Well, firstly, this CO2 is already in circulation. It's not coming from a fossil fuel that's being dug up and burnt. And then Mr. Aguchi has plans to turn it into methane and use it as a power source. The system has been designed for space travel, where water is the most precious resource of all. And there's nowhere to store waste either. But you can also think of the Earth as a rather large space station, where every resource is precious and existence is fragile. It's not a place of infinite reserves. And that's a world that really needs Mr. Aguchi's device too. The idea of making all our waste just disappear can only be appealing. But it's hard not to chuck stuff away. Life just isn't like that. Notwithstanding, one small Japanese community, led by its mayor, believes that you don't actually need to have any waste, even though you can throw away pretty much anything you like. Kamikatsu in the mountains of Shikoku Island in Japan is a fairly remote spot. People come here to take a step back from their busy lives, rest in a spa, have a walk in the woods, that kind of thing. It's also the scene of a unique experiment 
which is taking on the lifestyle of the Japanese head on. Mayor Kazuichi Kazamatsu is worried about waste in his community. So he set up a recycling station that borders on the obsessive. Everyone has to bring their rubbish here, except for their organic waste, which goes into a compost bin. And once they've washed everything dutifully, they have to find which of the 34 stations it belongs in. Some people know their way around. Others need a little help. Loco. If only they can find one of the volunteers who man the place. There are bins for crockery, light bulbs, bottles, other kinds of bottles, cans, more bottles, plastics, paper, metal, and stuff that can't really be identified by anyone without a degree in materials science. Once everything's all sorted out, it's packed up and sent off to various specialist recycling centers. Some special machines are used, such as a crusher to make transporting plastic bottles more efficient. And with typical thoroughness, the tapes that tie them up are made from 100% recycled plastic. The project's a success. Everyone's pitching in and doing their bit. And already, something like 80% of Kamikatsu's waste is recycled. But that still means 20% of the waste gets carted off to an incinerator down the road or to a landfill. Obviously, there's still work to be done. For the enthusiastic mayor, the problem is not the rubbish itself, it's the mindset. あの、これはビール瓶です。このビール瓶は日本全国どこでもですね、これ、これ、我々いるのは中身だけなんです。ところが、あの、自動販売機ができて、あの、缶ができてですね、それでももう1回のものを捨てられるようになった。ものすごい
We create greenhouse gases when we manufacture those goods, and we create them when we dispose of those goods again. But these Asian change makers are finding ways of coping with waste, disposing of it efficiently, converting it into useful things, or at best, avoiding creating it altogether. As Asia goes, so the world will have to follow. <laughs>